I like that room you're in. You got some pretty cool pigeon stuff in there. Yes, this is my uh, pigeon office in the house. I have one in the loft and I have one in the house. Okay. Are those all record book keeping books behind you? Those are pigeon albums, pigeon books, pigeon magazines, and pigeon statues and pigeon art. <laughs> Very nice. It. Yeah. You had mentioned uh, before that you have one of five complete collections of the American Pigeon Journals dating from, was it from the 20s? From 1920 to it went out of business in, uh, I believe, 1994. Uh, the reason I, I, I mentioned that is it was instrumental in my ability to write a history of the Los Angeles Pigeon Club, which I did in 2011, and the history of the National Pigeon Association in 2020. Without those magazines, uh, it would have been impossible to write either one of those books. The fact that the magazines uh, were so rare and hard to come by uh, made it extremely valuable to, to have. I had some difficulty with the Los Angeles Pigeon Club 100 year anniversary book because they started in 1911. And my collection, well actually the, the magazine itself didn't start until 1920. So I had a gentleman named James Moyer in Pennsylvania go through his collection of other magazines from the year 1911 when the LAPC was formed up to 1920. And he would Xerox off any articles from those 10 years. That was the only way that I was able to fill in the first decade of the history. Like you were saying too about the earlier issues just being not so many of them were ever even printed to begin with. To, to be able to find in, in one of only five collections. That's that's really cool. I, I really like the American Pigeon Journal. I have a a few stacks from like the 80s and the 90s. And I just, I really like the way that it's embracing a lot of different breeds. And they're all articles written by actual fanciers. I just, I really like that aspect of it. They're all so full of information. So I can- I see. love this story. Yeah. Now I can finally- now I finally tell my girlfriend that I'm keeping it for historical purposes. <laughs> That's exactly what, <laughs> what I did. Uh, it's kind of impressive when you look at the collection on my bookcase in the living room, because wherever I found a notation about the Los Angeles Pigeon Club or the NPA, I put a little slip of paper. So there's hundreds of little slips of paper that are in those books. So I didn't have to uh, to go back and, and search through every page. I had a rough idea where the historical uh, articles were located. I'm sitting in my shop here with pigeons cooing in the background. So I'm trying to keep myself muted when, when they start going into it, but it's, you know, reading season starting. So they're getting kind of loud occasionally. Makes me feel right at home. Right yeah, home. that's my favorite sound. Well, no, my favorite sound is the babies. The squeaking babies. Squeaking, squeaking for food. That's one of my favorite things to hear. Hello and welcome to the All About Pigeons podcast. I'm Phil. And I'm Chris. And today we have with us Robert Bob Nolan. He's the recipient of the NPA Lifetime Achievement Award, earned an NPA Master Breeder Award on English Trumpeters, Achieved Superior Breeder Award from the Western American English Trumpeter Club, author of the landmark books on the history of the LA Pigeon Club and the National Pigeon Association. He served as vice president or director for the L LA Pigeon Club for the 25 years, has been a judge in 10 countries, and contributed various articles in different pigeon magazines and bulletins for over 40 years. 
and we're just really excited to have him on and bob thanks for coming on and talking with us today and sharing some of your experiences with us my pleasure i was i gotta say when we first started doing this podcast and putting it together your name was we got to get bob nolan on here someday that would be really great <laughs> i feel like even reading through my old american pigeon journals i i'll read an article and oh, bob nolan and you know your name just gets moved around a lot in the in the world of pigeon fancy and you've done a lot for it too well thank you the reason i, I go by robert bob nolan is a couple reasons number one i knew if i was in trouble when i was a kid it's robert come here if everything was okay it was bob but one of my heroes of youth was william h pensum who if you read his articles always printed them william bill pensum and i guess somewhere along the line i picked up that idea excellent yeah pensum's definitely another legend in the names there so this was actually a listener requested episode people wanted to talk about conditioning their birds for a show i'm sure you could tell us a lot about all the different aspects but we're going to kind of focus on that today before we get into all the different individual questions maybe you'll you'll be able to answer some of them just by kind of shedding some light and telling us like what is your procedure when it comes time to pick that bird that you're going to take or birds um time frame of when you do it and then step by step what are you doing for supplements, vaccinations, things like this? What's your procedure for getting a bird conditioned for a show? Well, the first thing, Phil, that I've got to tell you is that's an extremely wide topic because different breeds have different requirements for preparation. One of the biggest differentials is muff birds versus clean light birds. And I have both varieties in, in large numbers. Uh, muff birds require quite a bit more preparation for shows. First off, we begin to pull out soiled and broken feathers approximately six to eight weeks before a show. As those feathers come in, we try to keep them in its best shape as possible. And one of the ways we do that is we have a perch that is circular and is uh, away from the wall, oh, approximately seven or eight inches, just long enough for the bird to turn all the way around on the perch without rubbing the feathers against the wall. Now, another thing that we have on that perch to prevent the birds from having their feathers soiled is we have a V-shaped piece of aluminum that catches the droppings from the birds uh, so the birds below are not, not soiled. So that's one thing. Uh, pull them up, have them on perches that are away from the wall. Probably the best way to keep the muff clean and conditioned is to have uh, shavings on the floor. I don't particularly have that. You know, this could be a, one of those cases where do as I say, don't do as I do. But <laughs> because I have clean light birds and with the muff birds, uh, most of my, all of my cages have a drop through floor. But the ideal situation is to keep the the birds uh, on shavings. And we like to use cedar shavings because they have a nice odor to them. Another thing to keep the muffs clean, you want to uh, give them a bath a week or two before for the show. You can't bathe the muff feathers uh, the day of the show, etc. They just don't uh, bounce back. The, the oil and, and stuff in the feather needs a day or two to respond. So pointing the old team borax in the water is a good way to help uh, uh, rid the birds of any lice that they have. And it also cleans the feathers up. So a bath pan is also very crucial to keeping your birds in good shape. Now we're talking about say an English trumpeter, house pigeon, west of England, any muff bird can go by those t- 
tips that I just uh, told you about. Some of our more successful breeders have small individual cages about three feet by three feet and they'll put one bird in that cage and keep it in there the eight weeks the show occurs. So that's another way that muff birds can be prepared for the show. Now that's just their muffs. There's other parts of the bird that have to be prepared as well. If you have a crested bird, house pigeon, English trumpeter, Camorn or Tumbler, none, any crested pigeon, uh, you have two options. If the breed allows it, you can pluck the feathers in the crest that are out of the proper sequence. Or if you're in such breeds as swallows, and I believe none, they'll actually allow the breeder to scissor the feathers in the crest at the base of the skull, at the base of the crest, to uh, make it uh, more even. So that's another uh, preparation. If you're raising uh, breeds that are like powders, they work best if you put them in an individual cage away from other birds. And you actually coo with them and get them to become accustomed to you and want to see human companionship. So when they go into the judging pen, they're number one, not afraid of the judge. And number two, they will show off because they've been held in solitaire for such a, a long period of time. I could go on and on. I mean, almost every breed has got different things that have to be done. A fantail has to have its tail laid. So if a person is deciding to take up a particular variety of bird, they need to make the acquaintance of a person that has raised them for a, successfully for a long number of years, and they can be tutored by those fanciers. Uh, That's great so advice. Different little tricks of the trade, so to speak that uh, one can learn from a mentor. Yeah, someone specific to that breed. And I mean, you really gave us a lot of really good stuff right there, though. That was, that's all really good tips. Like you say, it's a pretty wide brush to say conditioning, but it's specific to each breed. But your tips for each breed, especially, you know, clean legged and not pretty on point, pretty helpful. Especially about the powder, that's something really interesting, you know, cause you gotta get it to globe up for the judge. So keeping right. it keeping it isolated like that and separated, and, you know, used to you, I, I like that. That's really good advice right there. Uh, some guys even take it to the extreme. Uh, they take and they put cardboard around three sides of the show coop or the individual uh, pen that they're uh, keeping the bird in so that they can't see the bird next to them. The station in a breed like Holly Croppers is crucial. And as soon as they see another bird, they break station. You'll find, uh, especially uh, with the Holly Croppers, often have papers on three sides of the cage so that the bird can only look forward. I've seen this in many powder lofts as I've been looking that they generally isolate them and keep them virtually in the dark. I know they do that with the rollers to, to make the rollers fly better. They keep them in a darkened cage. I don't necessarily keep them in a dark cage. I keep them in a blind cage. The material I use is a punch plate and it allows light in, but you can't see through it very well. Do you find that the birds fly better than when you let them out? I'll be able to tell you that in two weeks because I changed my, uh, I changed my kit box. Uh, the one I have now, it's very well lit, but uh, they've got limited visibility. I do have a, a small opening on each side so that they can sight in. It's pretty much blind. Do you use any kind or recommend of any kind of supplements or medications for before or after a show? To be honest with you, I, I haven't used a lot of uh, preparation medications. We have used some 
the most important, of course, is your vaccination for PMV. That's something that everybody you know, really needs to do because that disease is uh, very lethal. Once they get it, they either are going to die or they'll sometimes survive on their own but still have a twisted neck. So I would strongly suggest that anybody that uh, takes their birds to a show or mixes their birds with another loft of birds that they use the PMV vaccine. Now I uh, personally favor shooting the vaccine in the wing area where the wing joins the body, kind of like in your arm where your arm lifts, where your arm is connected to your body. There's a little fatty pocket there that you can shoot into. A lot of guys shoot the birds in the neck, but there's a slight chance of uh, hitting a vein in there and killing a bird. I did that one time in the, my early years when I was vaccinating in the neck and since then some of the racing homer guys have told me that uh, they do it in the leg area. You shoot away from the leg though towards the body and uh, you'll never kill a bird with a shot that way. A PMV shot in the neck you got a real rare chance of killing the bird but it is possible so I use the technique of the leg. And so you you is that the only vaccine that you give your birds is PMV? Yeah you know we're talking about medications and vaccines which basically are the same thing. If we get a outbreak of some disease then you may want to vaccinate for uh, hair typhoid. Sometimes we'll use vitamins and, and medications together uh, if there's an outbreak in the loft. Sometimes if you come back from the show, you, your birds may not have the immunity uh, the birds in that show do because each loft builds up its own set of immunities. If you mix a lot of birds together, of course, you're going to increase. It's like, like people going to a party and you got a hundred people in a, in a small room, you got a lot more chances of, of getting uh, something than you do if you're sitting out in the patio in the fresh air. Same thing with pigeons. Do you have a quarantine procedure for after the show? Yes, in fact, we're in it right now. We just returned from the national show in Louisville, Kentucky. The birds that were at that show have been put in individual cages uh, outside and they're going to remain in there for probably two weeks. I didn't have quite enough cages for all of them so a couple of my carrying cages have been put into use uh, for the uh, quarantine period. But that's, that's a good idea. Uh, where the problem comes in is if you've got a large entry of birds. I only had 20 birds at the National. But if I go to the Pageant of Pigeons or San Diego County Fair or something, I might have 50 or 70 birds in that show. And that's when the quarantining becomes very difficult. Are you giving any uh, vitamins or anything like that as a supplement during that quarantine after a show? You know, I haven't done much in that. I know the Racing Pigeons uh, fraternity is big on, on vitamins. I don't think that Fancy Pigeon guys as a whole uh, are as concerned about that. I think your racing pigeon being an athlete that it is, it may be more important. Other than a good bath with that 20 mule team, what uh, what do you do to uh, help with feather quality? Well, there's a couple uh, grains that appear to help <clears throat> improve the sheen and color on your birds. The one is flaxseed. That uh, was one that uh, I used to use a lot in the old days and put the shine on their feathers and it makes them slick. And uh, to some extent, uh, I, I think uh, uh, safflower is good. The safflower is good because they, it helps put weight on the birds. It's not necessarily the feathers, but it helps condition the birds because that's a grain that they really 
enjoy eating. I usually go after it first. Uh, safflower is also helpful when you're weaning your babies, trying to get them to learn to eat. Put an extra handful of safflower in there. Or if the bird's sick, just put some safflower down there and hopefully he'll, he'll eat that. And uh, hemp seed is another one that uh, will, will help with the condition of the feather. Uh, very good. Thank you for that. So what I'm gathering for most of it is that the oil and the grain is what's uh, which helps. Yeah. What what we're looking at. Do you ever add? Have you ever tried adding any oil to the grain? Um, I use oregano oil. No, I have not. I have not done that. Okay. That's not safe to say that it's uh, not a good idea or it's not, you know, an aid. But I just have not done that myself. Gotcha. Yep. Everyone does. Everyone does it their own way, for sure. Yeah, and different breeds and different guys have got different things that work for them. Climate, of course, is, is important. Somebody that's uh, raising birds in California versus somebody in Canada or Minnesota or something, they're going to have a whole different set of challenges and uh, blocks set up. The best way to not have to reinvent the wheel is to find someone who has lived in that climate for a number of years and pick their brain on what works for that climate. That is something big to be considered because like uh, Phil and I, we live, you know, we live 200 hours apart. We're in the same state, but he's windy, windy and cold all the time where it's, you know, sunny and 60 here. So uh, we had to we had to kind of take that into consideration when we were putting things together. My situation, um, I can I can open her up a little bit, whereas Phil, he's he's windy all the time and makes the birds sick. Yeah, you know, uh, ventilation is really important to help. Uh, my loft, I have an opening at the back all the way across, about um, 24 inches high and eight feet across. And in the front, I have like a little porch, which is screened in. And the airflow goes from the front out the back. And then on the floor, I have the, it's a, a type of uh, grating, but it's made out of wood. And they're, they're about an inch apart. It's a drop through floor. So the dust and feathers and things have a tendency to go down and stay down below the grating and the airflow from the front through the back of the loft makes the loft probably about as dust free as it can get I like that's that good for the birds and it's good for you as well what type of wood do you use is it oak or uh poplar or pine or what uh it's a real hard wood i'm not sure what uh, you can get it from Jed's Pigeon Supply, and I've got to say, it's been in there for over 20 years, and it's scraped like once a week, and it's still held up. It's expen it was expensive. The longevity of it has amazed me. It's, it's held up for over 20 years. Oh, that's awesome. They come in sections about three feet long and about um, you know, 15 inches wide, maybe. Okay, we'll have to... We'll have to look into that, and that was on Jed's. I saw that on a trip to Europe. Uh, when I was in Belgium and in Holland, uh, we were taken out to uh, some of the racing over the lofts there, and they all had to drop through, through floor. And I thought, you know, I'm going to try to use that when I got home. And it's hard on the muffs. It's not necessarily good to condition your birds on, but I think for the general health, uh, of you and the birds, uh, the drop through the floor and the openings in the back of the loft are, are crucial. I did hear something you said there that was uh, very interesting to me. I know what you said, but uh, I want to touch on it for a second. You said it's uh, good for our health too, um, not only the birds. And why is that? Because the dust from the pigeons, obviously, any dust that you're breathing is, is not good. One of the things that's <laughs> disturbed me a bit in, uh, in Germany and a couple of the uh, European countries that I visited uh, over the years and the lofts which are enclosed because of the weather, you could almost write your name on the wall with the dust. That's just not, just not good. So that 
your climate would be excellent for a lot of open law. Like if I lived in Arizona, I'd have open, open on three sides. Okay. Yeah, I'd have the back saw, and I'd have wire on both sides, and I think your birds would 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 do well on that. Some guys do it that way, yeah. Once again, you have to take, you have to、uh, make your law climate friendly. So you have the Western American English Trumpeter. Are there any other breeds that you're currently working with right now? Yes, I'm a little bit like a guy in a candy shop. I like one of those, one of those, and one of those. The English Trumpeters would be my first love, and then I've got the Holly Croppers and Norwich Croppers, Vorburg Shield Croppers, House Pigeons, Pomeranian Powders, a few Fantails. <laughs>、uh, I see nothing wrong with a new person trying out several different breeds. They will eventually find their niche, what one works best for them, or what they want to to have. But it is very tempting when you go to a show to see some cute little breed of pigeon and decide, well, why don't I get a pair of those? Always been an admirer of quality. It doesn't matter the breed. If it, if I see a good quality、uh, pigeon, I'm tempted to want to add that to my collection. But、uh, I probably have more than I should. But、uh, hey, you only live once. Hey Bob, are you competing with all of the, those breeds? Yeah, we show almost all of them. I don't think we're not as、uh, competitive in all. You can't be competitive in all of them to the to the, the same extent. You know, I, I enjoy the competing. That's、uh, been a part of my life from the time I was in the third grade, and my dad got me signed up for a little league baseball and basketball, and got down to checkers or anything I play. I want to, I want to be、uh, competitive in it.、Uh, Cam Dick Gannigan, you probably know him from the NPA. Cam, he asked, "What was your favorite champion?" Oh yeah, I've got several birds that were. Probably favorites. The very first champion that I ever had, I was、uh, about 16 years old. I sent an English trumpeter to the annual meet of the English Trumpeter Club of America in、uh, Des Moines, Iowa, and I got my one champion in that show. That was a that was a great thrill because the judge was、uh, J.J. Keeper, who was one of the Greatest all-round pigeon judges in the history of the United States.、Uh, if you、uh, get a copy of my book on the history of the NPA, there's a lot in that book about JJ Keeper, and he picked that bird of line champion. And in those days, <laughs> shows you about how old I am. The bird went to that show by train. It traveled by railroad express. That bird was, it didn't have a name. It was just his band number was 5600. Any of the old timers know that that band number. That was、uh, that was the first California bird to win a champion、uh, ship in the Midwest. Another bird that I was、uh, famous for was called Tiger Prince. Once again, these are English trumpeters we're talking about, and that was probably. The best balanced bird that、uh, that I ever bred. It was、uh, a beautiful fifty-fifty、uh, black splash. Those were two that that really stand out in my mind as favorite champions. The last champion that I had was a a beautiful black seventeen oh nine. That was a pageant champion in nineteen ninety five. That might have been the very best. Bird that I produced to this point. What kind of advice would you give to a new fancy or somebody coming into it right now? Whether, I mean, I really like the advice of finding somebody in that breed. I think that's really good advice for、yeah. all the specifics of each breed. But、um, is there any kind of tips or advice that you'd give some of these new people that are getting into it? Well, that's a now that's a big topic, and I probably got a lot of answers. So hold on to your hat.、Yeah. Right. Number number one, I I think it's really important to try to find a mentor, somebody that、uh, lives close by you that、uh, has raised that breed of pigeon for some length of time. 
Uh, I was very fortunate to grow up in Southern California where there were lots of outstanding pigeon breeders that lived very close to where I grew up in Burbank, uh, California. Uh, John Beckman and Bill Penson, George Gerberg, Harvey Gatlin, all of these people played big roles in, in tutoring me and, and, and helping me uh, along the way. But probably of equal importance is to show your birds a lot. Don't, don't be discouraged if you, you come in at the bottom of the, the class. You're probably going to be competing against people that have been doing this for as long as you've been alive. I tell my daughter who's raising birds now to uh, just be patient because the people she's going up against have been doing this for 35, 40 years. And they're talented people too that have had important jobs. They're, they're not dummies. They know what they're doing. But if you can say that you've improved your birds just a little bit from what they were the year before, uh, then you should be satisfied. You don't have to have the champion or uh, even the first place in the class. That's, of course, a great feeling. But you've got to be patient. Uh, you're going to work your way up. Uh, in, in some breeds where the competition isn't real tough, you're going to get competitive quicker but if you're talking about uh, a breed that has a, a great degree of competent breeders it's going to take you four or five years to uh, become you know competitive and it's, it's like the Super Bowl there's only one winner and the same thing with the pageant or the national or anything else there's one champion in each breed you have to be content with working your way up and there'll be times when you should have won and you didn't and there'll be times when you won yeah, and you you, you didn't uh, uh you shouldn't have so just take it all in stride you have got to be uh, a good loser and a good winner it's just like sports you know you, that's one thing i thought i think athletics has taught me you know how to win and how to lose and you need to know that and, and pigeons as well that's great that's great advice yes and it, it's interesting you know i feel like you hear that theme a lot with with people who have done really well with these championships and stuff is that they they have that natural competitiveness in them too yeah yeah and one thing that you'll find a lot of in the pigeon fancy there's a lot of guys who are school teachers that's one thing the number two they've had uh, athletic background where they like competition. You, if you're going to stay with it, you have to learn how to lose as well as to win. One thing I, I like to think is too that people should think that they are basically the caretakers of these breeds. I didn't develop the English trumpeter. The breed's been in development for 150 years. This is just my little piece of history where my part is. So what you're doing is you're keeping alive the work of people that went on it before you, for the ones that spent their, their life making a fantail or improving a Jacobin or making a roller roll deeper or a homer fly faster. We're just a little piece of a puzzle and, and we should be happy with it or dedicated to keeping those people who are no longer with us their efforts alive it's a shame when someone spends their whole life developing a breed and then it dies out yeah that's a great perspective it's amazing how many breeds there are and it's really amazing that they've been able to stay around as long as they have with such variety still yeah it is but you know if you think about it and i've said this many times before if you go back, say, 100 years or 150 years, people didn't have uh, TV and iPhones and all this. They lived basically a rural life. They may have been born, spent their whole life, and died within an area of maybe 100 miles. And in that area, that town or something, they may have developed a breed of pigeon. 
they may have uh, uh, an Indian fantail or a, or a, a Danzig High Fly or Birmingham Roller or something. The ability of those fanciers should be recognized and, and the dedication that they did to get that quality of bird. And it still amazes me that I find breeds of pigeons that I see that I've, I've been raising these for you know, 50, 60 years. And every once in a while, a breed comes to my attention I've never seen before. That happened when the Iron Curtain came down. That happened when the Arabs started coming here to the United States shows and stuff. There's still breeds that we had no idea existed that were out there in some little town or monastery or someplace that they were developed in. I think I'm getting carried away. I've got to slow down. <laughs> Very, that's, that's very cool. Yeah, we're coming up against the clock here on our time. Um, I definitely want to take some time and thank you for this. You've given us a lot of good stuff here. This, I think, we can listen to this episode a few times and pull away different things each time. And it's definitely going to be an episode for guys to listen to before they, uh, for people to listen to before they start getting out there and taking their birds out. Thanks for your time. Thanks for coming on. This has been great. We're really happy to have you. And hey, I'll be. I'll be seeing you in a couple of weeks, I guess, up in uh, Utah. Right. We're going to go to the Hurricane Show, and we'll have an opportunity to uh, meet each each other firsthand, and uh, I'll try to steer some interesting interviewers your way. How about that? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I look forward to seeing your birds, too. I definitely have, uh, what do we have, 25 up there, one? I'm pretty jealous. I don't get to go to that show. I'm going to have to sit that one out. I'll be there in spirit. That's right. Okay, well, we hope you get to the pageant of pigeons. That's the one we talked about before. I think that would be a, a real value to you. Yeah, yeah, we're, we we were trying to get out there, but I think we're going to make more more serious efforts for next year. That's that's a really cool show to get to. Thank you yeah, very right. much, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Bob. My pleasure. <laughs>